because I'm going to leave. Good morning. Welcome to our service from, our, from the Unitarian Society of Northampton and Florence. I'm David Mix Barrington. I'm a member of the choir and the worship committee. Uh, it is wonderful to see you this morning in the Great Hall and online. Thank you to everyone who is helping to make the service happen this morning. Children are welcome in the Great Hall, and we have also have activities and child care downstairs if you decide now or later in the service that it would be a better option for you. If you are new or returning after a time away, we're very glad you're here. Please feel free to fill out a blue welcome card, which looks like this. Uh, you can put it in the offering plate later in the service. There is also an online version that you'll find through the link in the chat. We'll put you on an email list so that you can receive information about all our activities. We strive to be a congregation that welcomes people of all ages, races, religious beliefs, backgrounds, sexual orientations, gender identities, and abilities. We belong to the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations, and we are guided and inspired by values and principles. Our values and principles move us to remember that we in Northampton inhabit unceded land of the Pocomtuck and Nipmuc peoples. They remind us to acknowledge our responsibility to face the legacies of dispossession and systemic racism that are part of our collective history, even as we also affirm and celebrate the legacies that inspire us. If you are on Zoom, we ask you please keep our, we ask that you please keep your videos off except during the greeting. And now we'll begin our service. Hi, everybody. So sweet of you all to come. <laughs> it's sweet, sweet to see your faces this morning. Oh, you can't hear me, too? All right. Thank you, huh? I just I wanted to start by thanking some of the wonderful people who helped to get this service together, um, especially Jenny Ferringer, uh, Terry Harnaker, 
our pianist, Michelle Feldheim, David McBarrington, Molly Hale, Kim and Michonne, Steve O'Day, and all our service volunteers for their help in making this service happen. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Uh, the word grace has many meanings. The soulful grace in a living being, mindful action in the gift and receipt of forgiveness. And in those moments of epiphany, when the murky shapes of our existence come into focus and truth flows through us unimpeded like light across the waters. Now for chalice lighting. I invite everyone to rise in body or spirit for our chalice lighting. We'll remain standing for the first hymn, which is number six in the gray hymnal, just as long as I have breath. So, are there words, are there words for the chalice lighting? I see. It's our usual chalice. Okay. It's up there? All right, great. Okay. We light our chalice as a beacon of hope, a sign of our quest for truth and meaning. We light our chalice as a beacon of love in celebration of the life we share together. Okay. Here's the first of the four mini reflections that'll make up this service. I call this one a little bit of light. Excuse me? Louder. So I need to be closer to the mic. Hard to do. Am I louder now? Uh, if I could put this here. Is that okay for the Zoom folks? Yeah. All right. I didn't want to cover everything up with a service. I love that hymn. I can't get through it without tears, actually. Um, but sometimes that third verse, it feels just a, a little snarky. You know, <laughs> you ever thought about it? I mean, 
disappointment pierced me through. Still, I kept on loving you, you rat. <laughs> you know? It just seems kind of passive aggressive. <laughs> you know, it, it's like that Billy Joel song, um, She's Always a Woman to Me. You know that one? He goes on and on for like three verses, detailing all the ways in which this presumably ex-lover is a, is a jerk. Uh, <laughs> but at the end of every, every verse, he says, you know, yeah, she steals like a thief, but she's always a woman to me. <laughs> Gee, Billy. Um, it's not forgiveness if you're still itemizing. <laughs> well, I know I need forgiveness. I, <laughs> don't we all? You know, it would kind of mess up the theme, but I wish that there was another verse to him number six that gives us a chance to say how grateful we are that somebody still loves us despite all the time we mess up. It doesn't rhyme, but I'd like to add, <laughs> let's get a little feedback here. I'd like to add disappointment pierced you through and still you kept on loving me. Thanks, Terry. <laughs> Thank you for your patient faith in covenant with me. Tell them I said yes to that covenant we share. Well, I can't change him number six, <laughs> but I did write a kind of antidote to uh, passive aggressive breakup songs. <laughs> when I was 19 and just a pup, I had one of those relationships that don't work out you know, the kind where you just totally botch your attempt to love each other. And when she moved on to somebody else in a really awkward way, I felt worthless and squashed and cried a lot. You get the general idea. <laughs> in time, though, you get some distance on these things, these botched attempts to love. And right through the heart of sorrow, a little light comes through. Another word for grace. Here's that little bit of light. It's a song I wrote in honor of that botched attempt at love, in honor of a person I tried to love who tried to love me back. I call it looking for home. Last night I had another dream Thought you were beside me Someone's dog was barking someone's yard Thought I was home the color of your eyes but then you hid beneath the sort of haze looking for hope space for one another with an open door though it seems 
that people never change They never give it a try I'm not looking for you, darling I'm looking for hope Looking for hope Wouldn't it be nice to start off Save a space for one another with an open door. Though it seems that people never change, they never give it a try. I'm not looking for you, darling. Looking for hope, looking for If you're on Zoom, you're invited to turn on your videos, wave and say hello in the chat. It's helpful to switch to gallery view. Ring the bell again if you're uh, words. It has been good to see everyone. Please remember to turn off your videos. And where are we now? We're at the offering. Okay. Our generosity makes everything we do possible, and it helps us 
support organizations and movements in the greater community. Half of the proceeds of each, each week's offering, feed back a little bit. Um, half of the proceeds of each, each week's offering support the society's operating budget and half are shared outside our walls. The organization we are, organizations we are currently supporting are listed on the screen. If you are participating in on, Zoom, on Zoom or on YouTube, you can mail in a check or donate online. The link is in the chat. Our morning offering will now be given and gratefully received. She's gonna sing this while we're doing it. <laughs> It's a song about gratitude. In the evening, early evening, any time, when the smog clears away and the skyline is clear. Is clear, he is clear, he is clear, he is clear, get so clear. Here's the second one, a walk in beauty. 
Maybe we first think of grace as a physical gift, serene fluidity in movement. You look in on a dance class or any collection of people performing a task, and your eye is drawn to someone in the group who has it. Grace. It's not determined by gender, age, or size. It's not the shape their body makes in space. It's the way they inhabit that shape. It's the way they move from one position to the next with such seamless ease that the gesture stops your breath. A graceful person seems so at home in their muscles and bones that it's almost as if they're moving in a slightly different element. You know what I mean? Some invisible dimension that naturally sustains them the way the rest of us can do only when we're immersed in pool water <laughs> and prancing around in the shallow end in slow motion. Have you ever done that? <laughs> sort of magically effortless for a little while. We've got quite a lot of feedback going here. I hope that's okay. Is that okay? Okay. So as a visual aid, here is uh, an example. Exhibit A, my mom. <laughs> Circa 1948, Vogue model. Here she is, rocking a hat. And here she is, seducing a purse. <laughs> and uh, here she is, this next one. She's just looking like Greta Garbo. I imagine that the person directing the shoot said, look aloof. <laughs> but I wish I had a video. I wish I, I had a video I could show you of her on stage in her acting days. She moved with such striking ease and dignity that you'd never know she was legally blind at that point. And the furniture and actors around her appeared to her as a collection of vague, dark shapes. Always hit her marks. And here she is, about 40 years later. No makeup, and to my way of thinking, more gorgeous than ever. I got to look into those eyes for 63 years. She, uh, she was a woman of such grace that in her mid-80s, navigating the kitchen in her ratty blue nightgown with a coffee cup in hand, deep in thought, she carried herself so beautifully that you might mistake the moment for a regal procession from Westminster to Buckingham Palace. <laughs> that kind of grace. And when she couldn't walk anymore, she was grace in a chair. There's no explanation for the fact that this paragon gave birth to the linebacker who stands for <laughs> <laughs> But I do love to prance in the shallow end of the pool. <laughs> the problem is I moved like my dad, exhibit B. You see, he's just goofy. <laughs> you know, he's, a, he's an attending physician. He's director of clinical pediatrics, but he's rocking that hat to work. <laughs> he's going to show up looking like that. And here he is at 19. He's the kid on the far right, trying to look butch, but his uniform's too big for him. In four days, he's going to ship out for combat with the Navy in the South Pacific. He does love to sail. But this is a very scary kind of sailing. Right into the Battle of Letty Gulf. But right now, he's really scared of these guys he's doing shore leaf with. <laughs> Later this evening, he will escape them at the Hollywood Palladium when he asks Greta Garbo to dance. And happily for the kids, they're going to have 
eventually, uh, she will say yes. Here they are, Exhibit C, having dinner on the night he's come back from the war. They had just three dates before he shipped out. It's been a year and a half since they've been in each other's presence. They're both unsure of themselves and terribly nervous in their excitement about the situation. But she's so graceful, he doesn't notice. She's as scared as he is. <laughs> you can tell by looking at him what he's thinking. <laughs> she walks in beauty, you know, good God. How can I possibly deserve her company? This incredible grace that has dropped into my life. But he was a gracious person. Treated everyone he ever met with respect, and kindness. That sweet spirit swept her right off her feet. So you see how it is. They loved each other's grace. They outlived everybody they knew except their kids and their nieces and nephews. And differing as they did in religion, neither one of them got a church memorial when they passed. So I snuck one in for them just now. And uh, here's the song I wrote for them. Close enough. It's called Starlight. Take a piece of dawn, stretch it on the sky. Pretty soon the day comes, filling up our eyes. Now I'm on my own, busy all the time. That's how children are. Take a piece of dawn. Stretch it on the sky. I first learned to love looking in your eyes, and all you once had hope finding in the world. You see it in the mirror, your own boy and girl. The saints were children once before they learn to pray and everyone finds God in his lonely way but all I know of mercy and all I know of grace I met it in your hands moving in your face take a piece of dawn Stretch it on the sky. Pretty soon the day comes, filling up our eyes. But when the day is ending and on the darkness comes, you 
are my starlight. <laughs> Now please rise in body or spirit to sing hymn number 205, Amazing Grace. This is the third one, Amazing Grace. The hymn we just sang expressed the gratitude of its author, John Newton, a transporter of kidnapped people from West Africa into slavery, who knew grace in the moment he stopped doing this evil work and took up instead the international effort to end it. Grace was the experience of being granted not only the wisdom to see the right, but the strength to move in its direction. In the Christian conception, at least the traditional Christian conception, grace means the unmerited experience of forgiveness and mercy, forgiveness freely granted by the ground of all being to us humans who are inherently bumbling scumbags. Our job is to accept this mercy with gratitude and according to Jesus, to pay it forward by bearing with and doing kindness to each other in spite of our self-obsessed natures and our hurtful bumbling. So on the surface, perhaps it's a little weird to write about that concept from a Unitarian Universalist point of view, because the first of the eight core beliefs that define our otherwise non-credal faith is that we believe in and, infirm, and affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person. We don't start from original sin or the inherent depravity of humans in its aftermath. We start from the affirmation that every person 
has natural, inalienable dignity and rights, and is inherently worthy of the oxygen we breathe. But the attitude we covenant to assume towards ourselves and one another is a species of grace. It's the respect and compassion with which we recognize and embrace one another's wholeness as people, patient in the face of the limitations and foibles that just go with being sentient creatures. It's the energy that lives in respectful and compassionate action, a posture of reverence for the soul in each of us, an open, attentive, imaginative engagement with one another, loving right into the mess. I found myself in company with someone who hurt me deeply a long time ago, felt the dark filter of fear and anger fall away and let me see them as they truly were, longing as I long suffering as I suffer, hoping into the dark just as I hope, and wishing with all their heart to do better than either of us have ever managed to do so far. I have seen it, inherent worth and dignity, amid the hunger and self-doubt and all the bumbling it engenders inherent worth and dignity theirs and mine ours for our meditation this morning the words of henry Ehring: there is always time there is someone you can forgive there is someone you can thank. There is someone you can serve and lift. Let's be together a moment in silence. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Surprised by Joy by William Wordsworth. Surprised by joy, impatient as the wind, I turn to share the transport. Oh, with whom but thee, long buried in the silent tomb, that spot which no vicissitude can find. Love, faithful love, recall thee to my mind, but how could I forget thee? Through what power, even for the least division of an hour, have I been so beguiled as to be blind to my most grievous loss? That thought's return was the worst pain that sorrow ever bore, save one, one only, when I stood forlorn, knowing my heart's best treasure was no more that neither present time nor years unborn could to my sight that heavenly face restore. This is the last of the reflections. Surprised by joy. Thank you, Terry. Beautiful reading. The title of that famous sonnet is really misleading. <laughs> you see, surprised by joy, and you think, oh, this is, this is great. <laughs> um, but it's not. It's not, wow, suddenly I feel good. It's about being ambushed by a spasm of delight that the speaker feels instant anguish and guilt for having experienced. First, because the person he wants to share it with has died. 
And second, because he believes that in the aftermath of that loss, to experience joy ever, even for an instant, is to betray that lost beloved. He's describing something painfully real for so many of us who've lost someone we profoundly love. I know I felt it. It's one of the ways grief manifests in those of us left here for a while to learn how to cope with it. In time though, right through the heart of that sorrow, a little light comes through. Now, when I feel that stab of hopeless longing, the tear that follows the laughter, when I've enjoyed something I used to enjoy with someone I loved who is gone, when I felt my lost one's remembered presence and delighted in the memory, I don't feel guilt. I love them. They loved me. What they wished for me was joy. I half suspect they're the ones who were pulling on the rope to send it down to me. Terry and I get in the car these days and we're listening to the radio and the song is too jumpy and loud for us. And we find each other saying, too jiggly. <laughs> That's what my dad always said, if the music was too, too jiggly. And in that moment, I, I just, I feel him. He's in the car with us and he's saying, too jiggly. <laughs> Let's go to something else. C.S. Lewis used Wordsworth poem for the title of his spiritual autobiography, Surprised by Joy. But for Lewis, the lost beloved is not a mortal individual, not a mother, father, cousin, child, partner, all of which he lost, but the infinite ground of being which our souls remember and sense as through a glass darkly, but that we can't experience wholly because we manifest as mortal creatures and our brains are too limited to comprehend everything, except in these brief, startling intimations. For C.S. Lewis, it's a beloved not to mourn so much as to look forward to. The love we share on earth, a preview, a kind of training wheel for the infinite love of which our souls are capable, the love that brought us into being. And each stab of joy is a signpost pointing the way toward an awesome eternal completeness that transcends, that transcends anything available to us in our mortal experience. Kind of like Socrates' conception of the good. I don't know enough about any of this stuff. Their language for epiphany is their own, but I do know about being surprised by joy. Lewis distinguishes joy from pleasure. And I think I do too. I think of joy as an explosion of pleasure, like Three Dog Night singing, you know, joy to the world, all the boys and girls now, and the, you know, the binary and non barent binary people, joy to the fishes in the deep blue sea, joy to you and me, you know, just joy, just triumphant delight in being in this form while we are in this form. And when you're really deeply in it, you're not only imminent, you're all in it, but you're also transcendent. <laughs> that perfect happiness is infinite because it's perfect, <laughs> right? Release from longing. We are in the embrace of exactly what we long for. And it's also intrinsically impermanent. It is a kind of stab. That's what C.S. Lewis called it, a stab of joy. Because you experience both an ecstasy of delight and an awareness that you are experiencing the sensation, that you experience that emotion. So 
With that recognition, there comes a kind of wistfulness. Part of the intensity in the feeling is knowing you can't always have it. You haven't always felt and you won't always feel this exquisite clarity that you're feeling in this moment. Paradoxically, <laughs> that very impermanence is what makes it great. You breathe into that joyful moment and breathe in deep because you're not built to keep it always at this full pitch of recognition and delight. You'll have to release it soon. Breathe out and let it go. You won't always be in this restaurant enjoying the first taste of this fantastic meal with the love of your life. You won't always be sprawled on a couch full of your dear ones at your most relaxed in the wonder of being together, just enjoying each other, alive, alive, alive. Someday you'll lose one another. Someday you'll lose yourself. That understanding is an integral part of the joy. It's the sharp reminder to be fully present, to be here now, an interior voice saying, pay attention, don't miss any part of this. This is the point of being. Grace in the Buddhist sense of the word is the ability to rest in that moment appreciating both the breathing in and the release, conscious of this light that dances on infinite waters. You really need to breathe through such moments, embracing them and releasing them in the faith that though this moment must pass, there is enough time, always enough time, to live it deeply. If, paradoxically, you simply let it be. Now let's rise and body our spirit for the last of our hymns. Number 410, Surprised by Joy. Our postlude today is a song I wrote in memory of a certain beloved sailor. But it is for all of us voyagers. May we give and receive the grace of love all along this journey together. It's a pretty simple tune. You'll probably get the hang of after the first verse or so. So we put the lyrics in the slides. <laughs> And if you feel like it, you're more than welcome to sing along. We got some great choir people here. I, I, I'm looking for some harmonies. Let's make it happen.
rest my soul on the heaving tide sailing to that mystery on the other side where there ain't no the grace of love on the evening tide all the love we've known all the love we made all the love we're given just a giveaway when the journey's over, how that love abides, ripple into wave on the evening tide. Gonna live my day with that wave inside. Letting go my fear, living in the light, all along this journey, spirit be my guide, rowing me on home, on the even tide. On home on the evening time. You sound beautiful. Thank you. Go in peace, everybody.